the honorable speaker and moderator, Dr. Junaid, and the honorable guests and participants. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ifrani Yulani Iskandar. It's a wonderful and precious chance for me to be your master of ceremony on this occasion on Tuesday, the 12th of April 2022 in our webinar, Global Spread of Banana Disease to Sulawesi Connection, organized by the Faculty of Agriculture, Universitas Hasanuddin through the World Class University Program. First of all, let's say thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has been giving us guidance, happiness, healthy, and mercy so we can attend and participate in this event virtually. And this beautiful moment, I would like to uh, prop and drain prop, uh, from Queensland Alliance from Agriculture and Food Innovation. I would say, I would say thank you very much. Um, uh, if he is, we will be the speaker at our event today. Good morning, Professor. It's a Good pleasure. Morning. morning. <laughs> it's a pleasure for me um, to have you and our university as a speaker today. We also like to welcome all participants today for their presence. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have uh, several agendas for this special event, so please allow me to read several of our agendas today. Um, the first is the opening, the second is remarks, the third is the main agenda, which is presentation, global spread of banana disease, the Sulawesi connection from our speaker and discussion. And then it's followed by a photo session at the end of the webinar and then the coffee. Then, uh, we should uh, move to the other agenda, ladies and gentlemen. The first remark is the welcome remark that will be delivered by the Dean of Agriculture Faculty. And I immediately invite Prof. Dr. Insignia Salinke, MSc, to give his remark. Um, Professor Salinke, are you here? All right. Um, I think uh, uh, Professor our, uh, Salinke uh, have another agenda right now. Uh, so we, are, we, we apologize for that. And then the next remark is the opening remark and it will be delivered by Vice Rector of Research Innovation and Partnership Universitas Hasanuddin and continue for the opening of this webinar. However, this occasion will be, <coughs> sorry. However, this occasion will be delivered by video because today the Vice Rector of Research, Innovation and Partnership Universitas Hasanuddin has another schedule. So we deeply apologize for that. Please welcome Prof. Professor Dr. Muhammad Nasir Masih, PhD, SEMC. Pak Mustamin bisa diputar videonya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The Honorable Invited Speakers, Professor Andre Drent from Queensland Alliance for Agriculture and Food Innovation, the University of Queensland. The Honorable Dean of Faculty of Agriculture, Professor Dr. Insinyur Salenke, MSc, and distinguished moderator and participants. Ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> First, let us praise and send great gratitude to Allah, the Almighty God, due to for His blessing, mercies, and guidance upon our, all of us, so we can attend this webinar in a healthy condition. On behalf of the university, 
it is my pleasure to open this top scientist webinar series faculty of agriculture and to welcome you to this event let me take this opportunity as well to wish all of you as well as your families the very best for 2022. This seminar is therefore part of the effort by the World Class University program Universitas Hasanuddin and special thanks to Professor Andre Drath for your present and agreement to share a valuable topic with us. Ladies and gentlemen, the theme of this webinar is entitled with topic Global Spread of Banana Disease, the Sulawesi Connect team, Connection. In Indonesia, bananas are especially important for smallholder farmers, providing a food and an income source throughout the year, redu reducing the risk of food in security. Will banana species can be found on all major island in Indonesia, including Sumatra, Java, the Lesser Sunda Islands, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, Maluku, and Papua. In addition, Sulawesi Island is also one of center of biodiversity in Indonesia. Due to the recent rapid geographic expansion of the pathogen in Indonesia will have serious impl implication for banana production in Indonesia, Southeast Asia and beyond. The development of alternative management options based on the biology of the disease are urgently needed to control and contain this major emerging banana production in Southeast Asia and beyond. Therefore, we hope that all participants will get more complete information about this in this webinar. Ladies and gentlemen, this webinar Today is provided by the World Class University Program of the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research and Technology. Through this program, we are being supported to gain more collaboration with international colleagues in scientific activities. Therefore, we come for conduct more collaboration with Professor Andre Dretz from Queensland Aliens for Agriculture and Food Innovation that can be profitable for both of us. Before concluding, I would like to convey my appreciation to the moderators, Dr. Muhammad Junid and speaker for their time and support in contributing to this webinar, as well as my students in the Universitas Hasanuddin and for the committee of this event in this challenging circumstance. I thank you all participants most warmly for your participant and wish you all success with this webinar. Thank you for your attention and with that I would like to conclude my remark and opus of officially open this webinar. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. With the blessing of Allah, God Almighty, I officially open this webinar. Wabillahi taufiq wal Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Then, let's keep on to the next agenda. The main agenda of today's webinar about global spread of banana disease, the Sulawesi connection. 
from our speaker to Prof. Ander Drent from Queensland Alliance for Agriculture and Food Innovation, the University of Queensland, and it will be conducted by our moderator, Dr. Muhammad Junaid, the lecturer of Agriculture Faculty, Universitas Hasanuddin. Dr. Junaid, time is yours. Thank you, uh, Isra, for this opportunity. Uh, today, we are going to the seminar. So uh, the topic is uh, the global spread banana disease, the Sulawesian connection. But beforehand, uh, please allow me to uh, speak about who is uh, Professor Andre Tran. Uh, Professor Andre Tran is um, undergraduate plant breeding in Wageningen and Agriculture University in Netherlands in 1990. And four years later, uh, 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 finishes his uh, studies in plant, uh, plant pathology working in at the same university and Cornell University, United States, as a um, fellow of the Australasia Plant Pathology Society. Um, oh, this is a PhD, yeah. For current position, uh, uh, professor in plant pathology and program leader agriculture uh, horticulture crop protection center for horticulture science queensland alliance for agriculture and for innovation in the university of uh, queensland brisbane australia uh, his career is a lot of here plant pathologist with over 30 years experience in wide range of plant diseases and then in, in investigator over 46 external funding projects Chief investigator, 29 external funding grant, and attended to over 22 million dollars most competitive external categories, so many. And since 2011, given over 60 invited and keynote address for scientists and industrial congresses, numerous articles, grown journal, popular press, such as the conversation. It's a very conversation also as well and popular in Indonesia. Uh, for the training and the mentoring, uh, Andrew Jen has the last decade successful training 10 PhD students, including uh, uh, Dr. Jane delivered a talk in IPB webinar yesterday. The students have won between 18 awards for their research through papers, talks, and posters. Alan um, Karishwa is training 20 PhD students, all uh, have obtained position. Uh, leading research organization around the world, acquiring learning of secrets of success of in science, mentoring program with two Indonesian uh, universities, Universitas Gajah Mada in Jogja and Nusa Cendana in Kupang. Maybe next from uh, UNHAS as well, can be trained by you. Um, for membership and national board and panels, um, Professor Andrew is the director of Australasia Plant Biosecurity Science Foundation 2019 until 2021. Member of the National Stakeholders Board, Forest Agriculture Biotechnology Institute, University of Pretoria and South Africa. Member Banana uh, R&D Strategy Investment at Surrey Panel of Agriculture Innovative Australia. Member Science Reference Panels and MINI and research and chair of our committee Australasia Plant Pathology Society. So very important persons. About the collaboration professor on the trends as a global collaborative with extensive links to Asia, Europe, Africa, and Americas. Our current close collaboration with Wageningen and University in Banana Research as evidenced through several publications to publish books and church programs. Close Collaboration Indonesia, part of a research license to conduct research Indonesia, hold the talent visa for China stroke working with advisory Yunnan and Guangxi Academy of Agriculture Science. In the presentations, here a lot. Um, Andreas has a lot of publication pres uh, impact presentation, but uh, we'll just um, suppose um, presentation in 2000s currently invited address. The ever increasing spread tropical plant pathology in Australia Plant Pathology Society Conference, Melbourne, 2019. Invited keynote speaker and many things conference. And um, 
so many. So last in Python smell um, advance of vulnerability of Cavendish ca banana emerging diseases, Earth University, Mercedes, Costa Rica, 2019. So it's a very distinguished uh, invited speaker about the plant pathology regarding about the plant uh, banana disease. And publication as well um, from 2020, so now currently, a proper understanding published um, um, a, a journal with the topic of transmission blood disease in banana, plant disease as a first look with uh, Professor Subandia from IPB, actually, in no wrong. And also, uh, epidemic spread of uh, smart fung fungi by sexual reproduction in active uh, pathosystems, European Journal of Plant Pathology. And uh, in 2000, a very new publication also with title Current Status Pathophora in Australia, Persunia Molecular Phylogeny and Epilusi of Fungi. And, and also the vulnerability of bananas to global emerging disease threat. So many things publications from under then conducted. So it's a very interesting and then we are really uh, 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 lucky today. We got the uh, uh, distinguished speakers around the world and we can uh, deliver the talk and ideas in the webinar. And the last talking about the books and that books is uh, um, identify uh, spaces, practical guides for detection, identification, phytophthora. So I translate this book. Thank you very much, from the brand. So we got now the uh, the book version in Bahasa, so we can uh, our students can read uh, very well, understand the ideas, how the key detection for phytophthora. And this is the books. Um, well. There's um, so many things that from under them published books, publications, invited speakers around the world. And good morning, Andre. How are you? Can you hear me? Yeah, Prof. Andre. Yeah. yeah, thanks very much, Junaid in uh, Israeli for the kind introduction. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think the time is just yours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, I will. Can you see my screen now clearly? Is an large screen? Yes, clear. And you don't see the, the next slide? Yes, just one slide. Just one slide, okay. So that, that's fine. <laughs> So thanks very much for the invitation. I've been several times in Sulawesi and I've been in many parts of Sulawesi as well. And that will become clear in my presentation. Now Sulawesi is a special place and uh, I'm just gonna <coughs> outline and, and answer the question, why is Sulawesi so special? Well, there is some, uh, geological reasons, but there's also some social and human reasons for that. So the first reason is when the Australian plate moved up and hit the Asian plate, exactly there is a line where those two plates, those tectonic plates meet. And that line goes between Borneo and Sulawesi. So on the Sulawesi side, you have animals and plants which evolved in New Guinea, Australia, and Sulawesi. So you have things like uh, tree kangaroos, possums, uh, parrots, different kinds of birds, animals, and plants. On the Asian plate, we have uh, things like uh, mammals, like uh, deer, monkeys, cattle, chicken, and cats, uh, tigers, and rhinoceros, and so forth. So where the east meets west is actually very close to Sulawesi. So if you go from Sulawesi to Borneo, which is actually not that far, the landscape 
in the plants and the animals are quite different. And the person who was worked that out and he spent many years in Sulawesi, he was uh, Alfred Waller. So he was a, an ecologist who spent more than 150 years ago going back between these islands. And he was very surprised why they are so different. But there is a, a geological reason for that. <laughs> and that also has some impact on bananas. Now, Sulawesi is also special because it played a, a key role in the link between East, between the Spice Islands in the rest of the world. Because if you look at the older maps, <coughs> you will see that from the Spice Islands in the, the red line, so this goes back about 2000 years. So during Roman times, so 2000 years ago, in the Mediterranean, they were eating peppercorns grown in Indonesia. Yeah. So there was recording a link. in progress. There was always a link between the Spice Islands and between Indonesia and China and Indonesia and India and Indonesia in Europe. But that link went through many different channels. We call that nowadays the, the Spice Route. Yeah. There was a land route which is called the Silk Road and the, there was a, a spice root. So people in the Africa were eating things which were grown in Indonesia. And also during that time, some bananas were brought to Africa. So if you go to Africa today, you will see things like plantains, for example, they actually originate in Indonesia. They were brought there more than 2000 years ago by humans, by in Makassar, there were a lot of Makassar seafarers who played a major role in that. Now, there is another link with Australia, and that has to do with the sea cucumber, which I think you call that teripunk, because seafarers from Makassar used to go to Northern Australia and collect and harvest uh, teripunk and then take them back, they dry them, take them back to and Makassar and then sell them to the Chinese. So they had a quite a lively trade and there was sometimes more than a thousand boats used to go. So there was a lot of interaction and trade between the indigenous peoples of Australia and the people in Makassar. And in, if you go to Northern Australia now, you'll find in the local language, many words who come from Makassar, which is very interesting. Now there is an other link And that has to do <coughs> with bananas and has to do with my talk. And that has to do with the banana blood disease. And this disease started in the Salaya Islands about in 1905. Yeah? And then it, it spread to some parts of uh, around Makassar. And since that time, the, Indonesia was under Dutch rule the Dutch sent a man from Switzerland called Gorman. And he was one of the first people to look at why is this disease here? How did it get here? Where did it come from? And he published a paper. <clears throat> uh, and in that paper, he states, and that was in 1922, exactly 100 years ago. So he stated that if you look at publications of tropical plant diseases, that you diseases did not rate a mention and that bananas were one of the healthiest crops he'd ever seen. Now that is very interesting because today that is definitely no longer true. Yeah? Bananas is no longer one of the healthiest crops in the world. It is in contrast, bananas have many different diseases. Yeah, And if you <laughs> look at these, this is just a small a uh, window of diseases. We have Fusarium wilt, a bunchy top virus, yellow and black cigatoka. We have a freckle disease. We have moco, we have blood. Santamonas wilt only in Africa. We have phytoplasma. So these are sort of a top 10 of major diseases. So I was basically curious to find out <coughs> What has happened that we now have so many banana diseases? 
how do these pathogens spread all over the world and why do we have so many problems with banana diseases? So that was sort of my, uh, the aim. And, and so I'll give like a, a, what I call a bird's eye view of some of the banana problems in the world today. Let's start with bunchy top virus. So that is a virus which gets into the bananas, it stunts the bananas. So what you get is that the bananas stay very small, they don't produce a bunch, and this disease is common in Indonesia today. Yeah? But if you look back at the history, yeah, it started first in the Pacific. So in Fiji <coughs> in the 1890s, we started getting problems. Then we had a problem, it started in Ceylon. Now this looks far apart, but you have to realize during colonial times that the many British uh, seafarers stopped off there and then moved to some of the Pacific islands who were also colonies. So there is a, a direct trading link between those nations. Then it appeared in Australia in 1913. Yeah? In, in our, and it almost destroyed our total banana industry. Then it started <coughs> spreading in all the islands in the Pacific. Then we had an outbreak in North Queensland, but we actually managed to eradicate that for the simple reason is that there were very few banana growers there. So we basically destroyed all the bananas from those growers and then the disease disappeared. So that's gone. But in the meantime, it spread much further into India, it spread into the Philippines, it spread into parts of China, mainland and Taiwan, Vietnam, Cambodia, uh, it went to other parts, uh, some of the other islands in the Pacific. It was also noted in <clears throat> parts of Indonesia. So it kept spreading basically to many parts of the world. Yeah? So in more and more places, these diseases, they turn up. Now, if you look at this in a different way over time, then you will see that there is a typical curve. And this is the number of countries where Bunchy Top was found in a timeline on the horizontal axis. And you will see that the disease is slowly spreading to more and more countries. Now, if you're interested, I've actually written a review about banana diseases, which has all this information in it. Uh, I can send that to uh, June 8th to, to give you a copy if you want to. Yeah. Uh, so that is banana bunchy top. <coughs> Another disease is yellow cigatoga, so does Cospera musicola. That, we got that in 1924. Now, we did not manage to eradicate that. So, this is a case if you have a disease, you can't eradicate it, you have to control it forever. Every year, our banana growers, so they cut off leaves who are badly infected, and the leaves, the young leaves will come out who have the disease, so they have to spray with a chemical, something like 12 to 20 times a year if you have a plantation. And that costs a lot of money, yeah? So that costs millions of dollars every year. So Sometimes it is much cheaper to eradicate a disease because it's easy to control the disease you don't have. If you have the disease, you've got to continuously control it. And if you don't control it, you get a lot of yield loss. So if you look at this disease, and this <coughs> is in Latin America, it came in 1923 in Australia, in the 1930s, it came to Latin America. And you can see very quickly that within 10 years, it was already in 25 countries, because this is an airborne disease. The ascospores spread from leaf to leaf, plantation to plantation, country to country. So you get a typical, in epidemiology, we call this a sigmoid curve. So it starts slowly, it builds up very quickly, and then it flattens out for the simple reason there is only 30 countries in Latin America who grow bananas. Yeah? So there's no more, it is almost everywhere where bananas are grown in the Americas now. Now, the cousin of this disease is Black Cigatoga. So this is a Cospera Fijiensis. Here's a nice picture I took in Sulawesi 
where someone was trying to grow some Cavendish bananas, and that is virtually impossible because Cavendish is very susceptible to this disease. In Indonesia, very few Cavendish plantation for two reasons. One, the bananas don't taste that good, but also they are very susceptible to many diseases. So they need to be grown in other countries where the disease is less common or the conditions are less. Thing. <coughs> it's also in Latin America. This is a picture I took in Costa Rica and Latin America in a little trial plantation where they did not apply any chemicals. And you can see that these leaves are almost totally dead. Yeah? There is not much production. Without chemicals, these plants will not survive. <coughs> now look at what happened. In the 1970s, it came into Zambia and Africa. Yeah? So one country, then it turned up in West Africa. And then it started spreading in West Africa and Cameroon, it went to Nigeria, went to Ghana. And then it's spreading again in East Africa. Yeah? So you see almost two fronts, two different spots from where this disease is expanding from. And you'll notice that diseases always expand their range. They don't contract their range. Disease problems always get worse over time. And that is quite clearly seen here. So now it is in many of the, in the central Africa, which is the green belt of Africa, which is tropical with good rainfall and bananas grow well. Black Sikatoga is a big problem. Well, they didn't have a problem before. This again, if you map this out in a curve, you'll see from the 1970s, you get a similar curve again at spreading of a disease, a sigmoid curve. It starts in one place, it starts to spread to a few countries and then very quickly it goes to many countries. And in Africa, there is only about 20 countries who grow bananas. So Plexigatoga is everywhere now where bananas are grown. Let's go to Latin America because many of the bananas eaten in Europe, North America, Canada, uh, and even the ones in parts of Asia like Korea, China, and even um, Japan, <coughs> they come from Ecuador or Colombia. Uh, so in 1972, in an experimental site, Black Sigatoga was first found in Honduras. And from there, it spread to neighboring countries. So you can see once a pathogen <coughs> is in a certain location, it starts spreading in that location. Yeah? So it starts spreading slowly over Central America. And then it makes a few leaps. So it goes from island to island. So it ends up in Venezuela. It ends up further in Ecuador and in Peru. And then it goes from all the islands. Yeah. So you see it, it's basically spreading from island to island. That means the spread goes from one island to the next. Yeah. And if you look at a curve, you can see that from the 1970s onwards, the disease has spread again to almost every country growing bananas in Latin America. So you see almost the same problem, the same curve happening again and again. A disease gets out of its ancestral home in Asia, ends up in another country, and then starts spreading from there. Now there is a word <coughs> for this, and that's called the Brits hat effect. So a Brits hat is basically a, and this is an old uh, military term. If you want to stop another army, you have to have either a river or a natural barrier, and you stop the army at that barrier. Once it crosses that barrier, you are, it is in your terrain, and then it's much harder to fight man to man, whatever. So it's much easier to have a natural barrier. So that is a bridgehead. So if you have a pathogen in the center of origin, let's say Black Sigatoga from Southeast Asia, <coughs> and it gets into Latin America. Once it is in one country, it does not spread again from the center of Oregon. It spreads from that location, from because it is already in, let's say, Honduras. 
it spreads to all the neighboring countries. And from those neighboring countries, it spreads to other countries. So once you have the primary invasion, the other invasions almost follow and are much more quickly, you get very rapid spread. A good example is COVID. Once it was in China, once it left China, it spread very quickly within a few weeks because people travel a lot, it went everywhere and spread everywhere. The same with the new strains of COVID. Once they are out from their initial place and they are in a few other places, they spread from all these places all at the same time. So it's very important to stop the primary invasion. And this actually research come from the people did that with little lady beetles. So this is like an a, ecological understanding because I'm of the strong opinion that plant pathologists need to understand ecology because we're dealing with the spread and invasion of pathogens. Let's look at Fusarium wilt race one. And this is a picture from one of my field sites. So you can see that the, all the leaves turning yellow and they, this is a Pisanawak. So it's a variety commonly grown in Asia. Uh, all the leaves turn yellow. If you cut the pseudo stem, you see that it is a lot of discoloration of the vascular strands inside. The leaves collapse and you get at the base of the plant, you get the uh, rips occurring in, uh, in the bottom of the plant, which is one of the first signs. Now this pathogen originated again in Asia. We don't know exactly where, but then now, and that was about a hundred years ago. Now it is all over Southeast Asia, India, Pakistan, all over Africa, <coughs> East and West Africa, and all over Latin America. So again, it's the same story. Fusarium wilt race one from the 1890s, it spread all it first to Panama and from there it went from the different countries. So now it's in more than 60 countries all over the world already. Yeah. So this also led to the replacement of Gros Michel, which was a very common variety grown for export to Cavendish because Cavendish is actually resistant to race one. It has very good resistance. It's totally immune to this race one. So again, the same curve. So you'll notice the same story is visible. Every time a disease gets out of its center of origin, goes to a new place, it starts spreading very quickly over the world. Yeah. If you look at Fusarium wheel tropical race four, this is a picture I took in China of a uh, Cavendish plantation. And most of these plants are not very healthy. They look dead, they will not produce any fruit. So this plantation just will be abandoned because of a plant disease. It will be no longer productive. Here you can see in a picture. Uh, so we do, again, we don't actually know the exact place where TF4 came from. <laughs> it was first found in, in uh, identified in Taiwan. Then it was also found in Sumatra. And then very quickly, it was found in many places across the world. And now, so we have it in Australia, it's in uh, Taiwan, Philippines has big problems, China, India, it's in uh, Turkey, it's in the Middle East, it's in Oman, it's in Mozambique in Africa, and it's already in the last 2019, turned up in Colombia and in uh, Peru. <clears throat> so again, a plant disease which has spread very quickly around the world. So you can see that TR4, first found in the 70s, slow spread, and the spread is speeding up. And th this has always intrigued me. Why is the spread speeding up? Why are we not paying more attention when the disease is only a regional problem? We don't do anything. We wait until it is a big problem, but then it's too late. It has a spread. And in the next picture, you can see that we think in plant pathology that we learn something over time. But if you look at the spread on the black line over time of race one over the different countries, and then you see almost a century later, TR4, I would argue that TR4 is spreading more quickly than race one. There are some reasons for that. A simple reason is probably 
that there is a lot more travel and trade and travel is a lot quicker because I can travel to South America within a day almost by an airplane. I can travel to Indonesia within a day, half a day. In the past, I had to take a boat and it took many weeks to get there. So I think, but pathogens also spread much more quickly these days. So that is something to keep in mind. Now, Indonesia is a very interesting uh, archipelago because it is home of many wild banana species. And those banana species <coughs> or wild species have hybridized with each other to form the edible bananas. So there is many subspecies. We actually have one subspecies, Banksiae, also occurs in Northern Australia, but that is only one. You have many and those ones have hybridized with each other. So the African plantains we think look like to come somewhere from Sulawesi and about two and a half, 2000 years ago, they moved to Africa. The East African Highland banana it also comes from somewhere in Indonesia it is now grown in Eastern Africa. So some of the bananas grown in India also come from Indonesia. But again, since there has been trade for about more than 2000 years, it's very hard to work out exactly where they came from because there also has been a lot of trade and movement of banana germplasm within Indonesia itself. So over 2000 years, things have mixed up. So we don't know, often know for sure what is actually originated from where. But since the Wallace line runs through here, there are some differences in the uh, errands in Banksiae species than in some of the other species who come from the Asian line. You can see many seeded bananas. So this is actually on Salaya <clears throat> Island. And there are many interesting wild bananas there. And you can see they're very small bunches. They probably have a, a BB genome. You can see my hand, that the whole bunch is not much bigger than my hand. <clears throat> and they contain many, many seeds. So in these seeds, they <clears throat> are hybrids again, and they produce many uh, or much genetic diversity within the Musa uh, family. So continuously new varieties and new species can occur because there's a lot of mixing of germplasm in Indonesia. That has resulted in about 1000 varieties you can eat, but the bananas you can eat are sterile. So they don't evolve anymore. They occur because of some of the wild bananas <clears throat> they hybridize with each other. And then you get a, a two in a double gamete that hybridizes with a other single gamete. You get a sterile triploid with no seed, but something you can eat. And once the Indonesian farmers have realized you can eat that, they multiply it by suckers because the plant can no longer multiply itself through seed. So most of the banana varieties we have in the world today originate from <clears throat> somewhere in Indonesia. Excuse me. Now, where do all the <clears throat> pathogens come from then? Well, something happened <clears throat> in the, when Columbus went to America, and this again <clears throat> has to do with the spice trade because the Spanish and Portuguese wanted to cut out the middleman in this trade routes. They wanted to go directly by boat to the Spice Islands and not having go through all the Middle East, which in through Italy where people charge them every time the middleman, there were so many middlemen that spices were very expensive. So some people like Vasco da Gama went around Africa by boat, but Columbus decided to go westwards and then basically he didn't believe that the earth was flat, so you could go around and get that way. But while doing so, he ran into the Americas. And what happened then is there were many plants and animals who were exchanged. So if you look today, for example, in Indonesia, what you were eating yesterday, uh, if you had sweet potato at avocado, peppers, 
tomatoes, peanuts or potatoes, corn, they did not originate in Asia. They all originated in the Americas. Yeah? Even your rubber plantation, your cocoa, you grow in Indonesia very large, and Sulawesi is a very large producer of cocoa, and you have a mass factory in Makassar. Cocoa originated in the Amazon, in the America. So what happened is we started mixing up all the plants all over the world. Yeah? Many things like uh, bananas are now grown in Central America, but they come from Asia. So uh, cattle were moved to Asia, uh, coffee beans were moved there. So we started mixing up all the plants in the world, but also we started mixing up the pathogens, yeah? malaria, whooping cough, influenza, and you could add basically uh, COVID to this. Because we are traveling around, we are basically mixing up all the plants and animals, the diseases of the world. And this is often called the Columbian Exchange. And I put some books here, because some of these things, if you want to read more or in depth about this, these are good ways to get some deep understanding of some of these issues. What happened? Because history has a large impact on what we see today. Yeah? Now, how many plants are there then? And where is this diversity? So there are about 280,000 plants. There is many more insects. There's probably three, uh, many more fungi. There is about uh, between one and a half, three, some people say five million species of fungi. I don't know. It's about five million species of insects. And some people have, uh, and Shivas and Hyde have calculated, there's about 270,000 plant pathogenic fungi. The question is, where are they? <clears throat> well, most of them are in the tropics. There's a lot more diversity in the tropics than there is in the, near the poles. If you ever went to North Canada or you went to Norway, or then you will see that there is just pine trees. There's, there's very little diversity. There's not many diversity of animals and plants. The simple reason is that there was very little time. Those plants also didn't evolve there. They moved there after the ice ages. So very little diversity. In the tropics, there is a lot of diversity, and that's called the latitudinal biodiversity gradient. Most of the diversity in the world is in the tropics. Some tropical highlands, especially mountainous area, have more diversity than in the whole of, let's say, Canada or the United Kingdom, which they are very low in diversity. You can see that here if you look at plant diseases, because they are also much more diverse in the tropics. So if you look at, and I, I made, you know, can you look at sugarcane, for example, there is 450 diseases identified in the tropics, but in the temperate zone, there's typically only 56. In bananas, that is striking. That is more than 20, almost 20 times as many diseases in the tropics than you'll find in a temperate zone. Yeah, because, so there is a lot of diseases in the tropics. People often think that we know all diseases. No, we don't. Most diseases, we still don't know. And there's many new diseases coming up every year. So if you're a student in plant pathology, it's quite okay to start on something small, which is a new disease, because every disease started small somewhere. This is just an example of a new disease started in, in Papua New Guinea, in the Madang area, it's a banana wilt associated phytoplasma. It's probably linked to a problem in coconuts because the coconuts are dying and the banana show this really distinct yellowing. So this is a new disease only identified maybe 10 years ago. So this is the sort of thing I like working on, try to understand, try to find ways to control it and limit its spread. Yeah. So if you look at where do our pathogens come from, there's an interesting statistic. If we look at, let's say, Australia, most of our pathogens come from elsewhere. That may sound strange, but if I look at our agricultural and horticultural plants, almost 100% come from elsewhere. There's very few native Australian plants we grow in agriculture. There's only macadamias and a few other plants. So most we have introduced over the last few hundred years, most of our plants we eat 
But now the pathogens are following because we are traveling and trading a lot more and the pathogens are now also spreading around the world. That's why we find more plant disease problems. You'll see this in this graph. So this is a graph shows Australia. Since, since sort of records begin in the 1890s, you see that we have got 260 exotic pests on trees have come in. So in about two of them established every year. And this is only pathogens on tree crops. I'm not talking about other agricultural crops or even the native environment. So, and this would be the same for Indonesia. Every year, new diseases are coming up all the time. So this is why we have biosecurity. We try to stop this, but if you look at this line, it seems very constant. And it seems that some of our biosecurity or quarantine has had little impact. And that's not quite true because there, it has had an enormous impact. But the problem is that we travel and trade a lot more and trade is a lot more quicker than it was a hundred years ago. If we didn't do quarantine, this line would go up very dramatically. Let's look at blood disease because this is a disease which is really started in uh, your part of the world and has a very strong link to uh, Sulawesi. <coughs> So what it does, it basically is a bacteria, Rostonia syzygii subspecies celibacensis. It was, <coughs> the name was given to it by Ida Safni, which is an Indonesian scientist, so that's good. So you get, it gets in through the, the stalk and you get this discoloration of the vascular strands. From the stalk, it travels into the fruit. So all the fruit is badly affected. And in the end, the plant actually dies. Yeah? Now, I'm coming back to Gorman because in 1905, on the Salaya Island, all the banana plantations died. And that's what led the Dutch colonial administration to say, what's going on here? Why are they dying? Well, so they sent this Gorman, <coughs> this guy was a very clever man from Switzerland, to look into that. Now, I've been to Salaya Islands, and when I first came there, I looked at the flag, the, the, the weapon of the Salaya Islands, and it has rice and cotton in there. But when I was there, I never saw any cotton, which I thought interesting, because cotton was grown there until the 1870s. Then the cotton disappeared because the cotton was introduced from India very cheaply during colonial times. So the cotton industry disappeared. So the Salaya Island decided to establish banana plantations and sell, ship the bananas back to Makassar to make money. And that's what they did. And that went for about 40 years until 1905. Certainly all the banana plantations on the Salaya Islands died. And a little bit later on some of the other islands in that group. Yeah? on Tampia and on Cayude, that happened a few years later. So I decided to have a look at this. And <clears throat> one of the people from uh, UNHAS, uh, Professor Dr. Baharuden, actually worked on this in the 1990s, went to Germany, did his PhD on blood disease. So I've looked at that work very carefully because that is one of the last people who worked on this extensively to find out how this disease works and what it does. So that helped us enormously. But I decided so to look more widely than that probably. So what I did is I wrote some grants together with uh, Professor Siti Sibandia from the uh, UGM, University of Gajamada in Yogyakarta, and Jane Ray started her PhD uh, study on that. So I went everywhere in Indonesia to look at where is blood disease, where is it not, how did it get there, how does this disease work? And of course, I traveled in many key gems. This has been our trusted traveling partner in many remote parts. And it's one of the best cars, I think, to go to remote places because it has never let me down. So it's been very good. Tops. Now, so I went to the Salaya Islands and one of the people who helped me there a lot 
was the man in, in, in the center there. That is, that is Pak Hero from the Celaya Islands. He actually helped me to get samples from some of the really remote islands in the Celaya Islands to his connections. And they were shipped either by barge or by boat to uh, the Celaya Islands so we could isolate the bacteria from it. So he was very, very good in helping and traveling across the island, telling us about the history. The other person you'll notice here is Professor Ryan Mandita. He's the rector from the Nusa Sandana University in Kupang. So that is an, the reason he is there is because in Kupang, in the West Timor, there is no blood disease. So they are interested in keeping it out. Now, when you travel in Indonesia, it's very important when you see durians to try them because I really like durians. I even worked on durians. So it's very important to, uh, test out some of the, the very good tasting durians you have on offer. So here, this is in the Salaya Islands. We saw this man driving. So we stopped him and bought some durians and ate them. They're very good. So don't waste an opportunity to taste durians, I would say. Now, coming back to blood disease. So in, it was first noticed 1905 in the main island of Salaya. And it's Further surveys done by Gorman revealed that it was also in the Makassar area. It was in the lower area of uh, Sulawesi, in the southeast <coughs> of Sulawesi. It was found nowhere else. He recommended that there should be a quarantine. Don't move any plant material out of parts of Sulawesi to other parts of Indonesia. That worked very well because people almost forgot the disease, yeah? Because from 1921 to 1986, the disease was not found anywhere else in Indonesia. So people started forgetting about the disease because it was only a small problem on a small island and, you know, we didn't bother about it. But that all changed when in 1987, it started to occur in Java. And also, in, in very shortly afterwards, people started looking. It was also in Manado, already in northern Sulawesi. And from there, it very quickly, over the next decade, <laughs> it traveled to many. It went to East Kalimantan. It went, it went to some of the, in the Banda Islands. It went to Sumatra. It, it was found in Java. And so another 10 years, it spread further into Java. I went to uh, West Papua, uh, and then it ended up in, uh, it also is now already found in Peninsula Malaysia. I've surveyed there, and it's quite common there now. So it is already, in. I don't know exactly if it's in Thailand or not. I have not traveled there uh, recently to check that. But now it's also on the island of Zumba, and so it's now actually quite widespread on some of the larger islands. There's many other islands like East Nusa Tenggara. I could not find it. It's in West Timor. I've looked, it's not. So there's a few places it's not, but in many places it's already there. Now, Indonesia has about 14, 15,000 islands of which I believe six or 7,000 are inhabited. So there's probably many small islands who don't have it yet, but it is on the larger islands. So that is sort of a problem. Uh, the disease has spread enormously and I want to sort of stop its spread and find ways to control it. So <clears throat> that's what we try to do. So working with uh, Jane in City, uh, see, I am only there because you would notice that I'm reasonable tall because Pisa and Kapok is a very tall variety to get the disease specimen. So. That is my expertise, and that's where I excel. While City and uh, Jane do the, some of the work in the lab. So you can see it's a close up, the vascular strands are all discolored. You see a lot of discoloration in the fruit. So, this is, we looked at the distribution of the disease. So, this is, we published this recently in Plant Disease. So, this is, uh, I can send you a copy of this paper. You can see a lot more detail in it. Now, we also wanted to know how does, which plant parts are actually infective? How does this disease spread? 
So we did a Jane did a lot of experiments. We had in near uh, Jogjakarta, we had a small field which we uh, rented. We planted pisang kapok and we planted cavendish, and then we did a lot of trials. And what we found is, <coughs> and I won't go in great detail with this, what we found is that the female flowers are infective, the male brax scars, so the scars is where the brax break off, they're infective. The flower cushions, so when the flowers fall off, they <coughs> are infective. So that's that little, the little lines here. If you break off the rakis, so that's where the flower is attached, that is infective. And if you deflower fruits, you can get also uh, infection through there. So all the male and female parts are actually susceptible. Again, we published this in a paper in phytopathology is called susceptibility of the banana inflorescence to blood disease. So we try to get all the information from the last hundred years, check it and do a lot of research to find out which plant parts are infected. Now, how does this actually work? Because we think an insect comes, visits a diseased banana, goes to a healthy one, but if he's just visiting and not injecting it, can you actually get infection? Now in bananas are interesting plants because they have open xylem vessels. So what we did is we took some, a little bit of blue dye. And if you put that in a flower, you will see that it very quickly gets taken up in the banana. If you take a little bit on a female flower, a brax car, a, a flower cushion, <coughs> if you cut off the rackets, you put some dye on it, you'll find it the next day already inside the fruit. You can see that here on that picture, it goes through the rackets and then it makes its way into the fruit. So yes, the vessels are open. So you only need to put a drop of the bacterium on any of the flower parts and the banana will basically suck it in itself, take it up and then once it's inside, it starts growing and the infection goes from there. To do these trials, we needed a diagnostic test. We needed to know if I cut off infected banana here, how long does it take before it is in the other banana hand, for example? So then we made a diagnostic test. There was a test already available, which Mark Vegan had developed <coughs> many years ago. And that was, it's called BDB one-to-one, -one, banana, banana blood disease bacterium one-to-one -one test. That is actually based on the megaplasmid. So the genome of this bacterium has two circular DNA strands, circular DNA molecules, a 1.6 megabyte megaplasmid in a 3.6 megabyte chromosome. So we designed a new test on the chromosome, a real-time PCR test. And again, you can find all the details in a recent paper, which we published with Vivian Recon Flores in my lab, developed and published diagnostics of banana blood diseases and plant disease. So again, it's good for biosecurity, but when you do research, often you need a test to know if I infect a banana, how long afterward is it in the pseudostem? Where is it? So we can take samples and then determine where it is in the plant. So that's how you can basically work out how this all works together. So how does it go from one plant to the next? And that's another key question. Yeah. So we've basically, had infected plants and healthy plants, and then we took uh, material. So we, you, we can also see that insects, if they visit, <coughs> if a brack falls off, there is droplets here in the morning, and insects visit it because they like those droplets on a banana are sweet. So insects will visit there, and then they go from one plant to the next. If you go from a disease to a healthy plant, especially to a male bell, go from that plant to another plant, then they take the bacterium with them. If they put the bacteria there, then it gets taken up, sucked up into the banana plant and the plant gets infected. So again, we looked at transmission. And that again, we published a paper on the transmission of this disease also in plant disease. So one way 
to control blood disease is actually after the female bananas are formed is to remove the male bell, but never use a knife because if you cut a plant with a knife and the plant is infected, the bacteria are on the knife. So all the plants you cut off afterwards, you infect them. So you need to, without touching that male bell, break it off. So we wanted to work on a large control effort and come up with a, an integrated control strategy. But then when COVID started, we have ideas of control. We tested some control in our field trials, but we have not done this on a larger scale because this needs to be done in a village scale because everyone needs to do this. Otherwise, uh, if your neighbor is not controlling the disease, the insects will take it from his plants to your plants. So this is like, you know, what you call that area-wide management. So this needs to be done in a communal fashion together with the extension service. So that is something that would be part of a follow-up project to looking at it. So what is actually my research approach? Yeah, because many people think, why are you working on this? Well, what's the point of doing this? And especially since we, this disease is exotic to Australia. Now, <clears throat> but we do, are worried about it because if this disease comes to Australia, we have another disease to deal with. So I spend a fair bit of time to looking at what are the new diseases, the new threats who are spreading. Yeah, once I've identified it, let's say, and blood disease is one of them, I'm looking at the population biology. Where is the pathogen? How does it cause disease? I started making a collection. See, are all the strains the same? How different is it from other diseases? Then I look at the disease cycle and epidemiology. So how does it spread? How does it get, how does it infect? Uh, is there any resistance, whatever? You can see in this picture here, Jane is, we had these lads, I call them sort of socks almost. Uh, those are nets to keep the bacteria. So if we kept the, the insects away from the bananas. We never got disease. But this is a lot of work to do, but you, it can be done in a biological control way. And then there is spread. Many people in Indonesia, but this is throughout the world the same, if they visit a new place, they like to bring a present. So they love to bring, so, oh, this is my favorite banana variety. So many varieties, people bring planting material from one island to the next. If you take a sucker from an asymptomatic plant, so plant is infected but not show symptoms, you are spreading the disease. And that's how I think it goes from island to island. Once it is on a new island, it'll spread by insects. So I'm using some of this material then for to develop a diagnostic test. Yeah? So if I can detect the pathogen and I use a, what, yeah, a NATA, that is basically our tests are internationally validated. So they have to be of a certain international standard or standard of excellence before I can publish them or before I would use them. So once I have a good test, I spend a lot of time making growers, our growers also globally aware of this new problem. If you see this, contact us uh, and to basically, if we find it early, we can eradicate it. If we find it too late, it's already spread, it's impossible. Also, when plants come into Australia from breeding programs or from companies, they have to go in a quarantine glasshouse for 18 months. They get observed and tested, and only when they're free of disease, they can be moved on and planted in a field. So it's basically prevention of bringing new pathogens into the country. So there is, that's sort of roughly my approach. Uh, who pays for all this? Because this is important. If you are at a university, you get your salary, but not much money for operating. So I get money from horticultural innovation. They have a banana fund. So that is funded by every kilo of bananas, which gets sold at like 1.2 cent goes for research. So I get some funding from that. I get some funding from the Crawford Fund. That is, I did these uh, international engagement award with them of training scientists in Indonesia, for example. Uh, we got some training from the <coughs> Inter-American Inter Development Bank to do some work in Latin America. 
UPM in Malaysia helped us with some work. I had a uh, world-class professorship at the University of Gajamada. So that is paid by the Indonesian government. They paid some money for upgrading of facilities to do some of this work. We get some money from the banana industry, the Endeavor Foundation that paid for Jane to spend, Jane spent about nine months in Indonesia. So I have some students of mine, Australian students in Indonesia. I also supervise some student, Indonesian students at UGM at University of Queensland. So we have like an exchange. And then there is the Plan by Security Science Foundation who also funds some of this work. Now, who is doing all this work? Now, I am very lucky because I have a small but a very effective team. So one of my senior researchers is, is Dr. Lilia costa Cavale. So she does a lot of the uh, planning, a lot of the writing, a lot of the research. Cecilia Dwyer has worked with me for more than 20 years. Basically keeps everything running, does a lot of the diagnostics, looks at new diseases. Vivian Rincon Flores does a lot of the development of the diagnostic assays. And Jane Ray worked as a PhD student only on blood disease. So she spent some time in Indonesia to really look at how does this disease work? What can we do about it? How important is it? How can we control it? And, and so on. So that she has submitted a PhD uh, a couple of months ago. Now, one thing I like to stress, and that is that international collaboration is very, very important because it is really a key issue <coughs> in here. And that picture you see actually, and I'd just like to thank the late uh, Jenny Marcus from Kupang because she has helped us enormously with the initial setting up of some of this work in the past. Uh, so international collaboration is key because these diseases, banana diseases do know, not know any borders, banana grown in many countries. So <coughs> if we, work together, we can do a lot more than if we work separately. So I've been lucky to travel to many parts of Indonesia, China, I've been many uh, interesting, I've met many interesting people, interesting scientists. Most of the growers are very friendly and very helpful in looking at and discussing things and whatever. The other picture that is that came out from Wagoning, so I have a very close collaboration with many parts of the world, uh, from South America, Africa, throughout Southeast Asia. And that is, so the international collaboration makes my uh, program possible. Now, what did we learn? Well, one thing is that tropical pathogens are on the move. We know that from COVID, that pathogens move very quickly. They also move, and I, that's why I have that plane there. They pathogens, they move by planes. They move very quickly. You could see that by COVID, very quickly, it's all over the world. In the past, this went very much more slowly because we couldn't travel between continents. We went by boat, took months. Now it goes all <coughs> within a day. So travel and trade have moved pathogens and we have more development in the tropics. So tropical pathogens are really spreading at a rapid rate. And with global warming, the tropical pathogens also moving to the more temperate zones. So the temperate zones get a feel of how difficult it is for tropical growers to grow a crop. The bridge head effect applies. So the bridge head is that effect. Once a pathogen is to a new place or a new continent, it'll start spreading from there and spread becomes a lot more difficult. Now, if you want to eradicate <laughs> something, you need to act very quickly. We have managed to eradicate bunchy top from the north we have eradicated freckle from the Northern Territory in Australia, and we've eradicated black cicatoga from a growing area. But you have to be there really quickly and really early in quick action. It's like this cat trying to catch the mouse. If you miss it, then it's too late. And, and this is my cat at home. My cat is not doing his job very well. He's normally lying there, not doing much, and he will miss the thing. So that's it's very difficult to catch the early invasion. So most of the time we miss it. We gotta be lucky or we gotta look very often and very rigorously. So it's very difficult to do that. So, but when you can, you shoot. So 
I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention and please feel free to ask any questions about either this disease or <coughs> other diseases or larger issues. This is just a picture of some of the banana diversity somewhere in Indonesia. So thanks very much for your attention. And I hope to visit Yunhas in the sometime in the future again, because I still have many unanswered questions on blood disease and other banana diseases. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Andre. So many, many questions too here. We'll drop to you actually, but uh, the problem is we have to finish at 10 o'clock. I mean, a couple of minutes ago, we will finish for the questioners. I'm really sorry, we just select uh, maybe two or three questioners. Um, this is a very interesting uh, slide, uh, Prof. Andre, and then uh, very touching and uh, very engaging how the uh, uh, Sulawesi connects as a place important roles of banana, a uh, global banana disease global uh, spread banana disease and yeah so interesting the uh yeah i get, I get the the point that's a bridge of effect yeah it seems a uh, coronavirus disease spread around the world yeah, yeah. banana disease as well yeah so interesting but um the attempt to uh to to solve the solution is uh, quite different but COVID 19 is a uh, around the world people pay attention and then do the same by banana need to be more the same with the COVID-19 uh, uh, control. Uh, well, so uh, there are several questions uh, dropped in the chat room here. I will, I will speak and uh, this is from uh, Ivan uh, Brugman. Andrew Brookman, under Grant, uh, she is our a new staff member, uh, staff academic staff in in plant uh, plant pathologies in our department. He is still she is still master degree and she is pursuing her PhD. And if you don't mind, can to accept her as a, your student for PhD, understanding about the banana disease. So that's a very good thing. And Iron Brookman is um. Uh, question is, I have several questions for you and then how do you think this uh, pathogen, block disease banana, uh, survives in the long distance movement and stays uh, viable as inoculum? Uh, they have two, two questions here. What is the uh, uh, crucial factors? The, the successful migration or invasion? And are the population genetic variation might contribute to the invasiveness? Okay. I is also happy working in the molecular biology. Uh, her piece, the hair master, this is talking about molecular biology. Uh, okay, so, uh, so we, we go to you, Andre. Okay, yeah. so yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer Irene's question. Uh, if you have a banana fruit with banana blood disease, and it's likely in fact that I had material sent to us in after a week, for example, we can very easily isolate blood disease from that tissue. So it will quite easily stay for, I think several weeks. If, if, if it's likely infected and not totally rotten, you can take it, you can have a very low infection so it can yeah. easily move. Yeah. If you take a plant material, a small sucker from a large plant, with as a low infection, it'll last in there for probably quite a long time, more than a month. So that is enough time to take that sucker, travel all the way to another island and plant it. And then the, as long as the plant is alive, the bacteria will be alive as well. And then you move it that way. That has been shown uh, in, in MOCO and in other bacterial diseases that as, as long as the, the plant is intact and can, and can grow, the bacteria will survive. So you, it's, there is a little bit of variation and that, that is, but I, I wanted to go to some of the outer islands of the, uh, the spice islands to look at if the actually blood disease is there because the blood disease you find in Indonesia is, a, is almost all the same. The strain 
you find in Sulawesi is a little bit different because I think that's the original strain. The one who got out from Java has spread everywhere in Indonesia. So that's probably the same strain. So there's no sequence variation. There's a little bit of variation with the strains found on the Salaya Islands because those strains probably got there 100 years ago. Well, the one from uh, Java got there only 30 years ago and then spread everywhere. So yes, there is variation, but not a lot. But again, I do not know what the center of origin is. Is it really uh, South Sulawesi or did it come from another place and it was first there? That I have, see, I can read all the old Dutch literature about it and I cannot really find out. I've tried to look at areas who had problems before, but sometimes they say they have a problem, but then I don't know. They call it wilting. I don't know if it's Fusarium or Sigatoga. So it's not in the photos. Most of the time there are no photos. I do know they had problems in Manado in the 1870s, but I don't know what the disease is. I have no records or whatever. So I, I would like to do more surveys in some of the, re, the other islands in the uh, maybe the lower Sunda Islands to see if it's there or not. Okay. Thank you very much, Andre. So, um, uh, Professor Tutikus Nyoanti, I saw you raise your hand. Your your hand is raised. So, so yeah. Professor Tutikus Winanti? Yeah. Okay. okay, thank so, you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, first, I want to thanks to Dr. Dren for a very interesting presentation. My name is Tutikus Vinanti from uh, Plant Protection Study Program. Yeah, uh, I know that you have so many experience about the banana disease, not only in uh, outside Australia, but also in South Sulawesi. So, but if we talking about the control strategy of the uh, banana disease, it will be very difficult. This is based on uh, from many reasons. The first, uh, the banana plantation are grown uh, not for uh, commercial purpose, so that the farmer have no effort for the uh, control uh, strategy. And then they has also a very level of education and also economic level, so that is uh, they are not welcome to the uh, technology strategy that we uh, we given. So in this uh, situation, what is your opinion? How to give uh, effective uh, control strategy for um, outcome? the so many uh, banana diseases in Indonesia, especially in South Sulawesi. Thank you. Th thanks uh, to take for this question, because this is sort of a very uh, interesting question. If you look at something like in Sulawesi, you see a lot of uh, cacao plantations, yeah? And, and you were in the beginning, I was there in the 90s, and there was very little disease because cacao is introduced. So you introduce the plant and there's few diseases. Now you've got a few more diseases you, you know, introduce, but you have rubber plantations in Indonesia. <clears throat> they also, rubber comes from South America. So very few diseases. You can have large plantations. If you go to Sulawesi, you cannot have a large scale banana plantation because you will be able to get too many diseases. I mean, people have tried that in Sumatra. They started banana plantations and then tried to go for export to the Middle East or whatever. But that's very difficult because currently, wherever you are in Indonesia, you see bananas, but they're all spread out. Yeah. So every grower has a few bananas. So there is like a, and there's many other plants in between. So these diseases, they spread very slowly from one plant to the next. If you put them all together and the leaves are all touching and they are in a plantation like 1700 plants per hectare, 
it doesn't work. I, I went to that Cavendish plantation in Sulawesi. There was only maybe one hectare. And I don't think they will get ever any yield of it because it doesn't work. All the diseases are there. The conditions are, it's nice and humid all the time. You get black cigatoga, you're gonna get fusarium, you're gonna get blood disease. It's gonna be very difficult. If you spread these plants out, like it is now, yes, you lose some due to disease, but the, the risk of spread is much lower because every plant is 200 meters away from the next plant. So the disease spread is a lot slower. It's like COVID, it's distancing, yeah? You know, one and a half or two meters, so you don't get spread. If you put it all together and you allow spread from one plant to the next. So I don't think that Indonesia ever will have a plantation industry. If you look at some of the islands though, like I went to, uh, if you go to Zumba, they had a lot of pisang kapok in plantations and they were selling them by boat to Bali. Yeah? Uh, but that has stopped. They got blood disease and it wiped out their plantations. What you get is all the bananas die and then you get some coming back that all separated, spatially separated. So the, the bottom line is, it's very difficult to have a plantation in the center of origin. There are no rubber plantations in the Amazon. They are in Thailand, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, and in China, on the other side of the world, where all those diseases are not. The cocoa is grown in Africa, it comes from, so it's all to do with where you grow it. And, and you will have other diseases. So it's, Although bananas is very important in Indonesia, that is not an industry, it is a cottage industry. Every grower has some bananas in the garden, around the house. Uh, there is, I think, I don't know exactly, 6 million tons harvested each year, so it's quite big, but no, that is not really a statistic and it's not rated as important, but I think it is very important from a food security point of view. And many Indonesians eat bananas like pisang and kapok uh, for breakfast or cooked or you have many dishes, many varieties. You go to the market, there's lots of bananas there. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so Andre, actually uh, we have a uh, uh, happen this, yeah? Banana Kasendis, and I think Ibu Tuti and Probar also part of the successful uh, uh, cultivating uh, Kapendis disease, uh, Kapendis variety, and resist to uh, Sigatoga or something like that. Because of I supervise her, their students, uh, I examine the students when they are under uh, seminar, yeah. So what do you think about this the Kapendix uh, uh, species so, uh, probably resist to uh, uh, several uh, banana disease like Sigatoga or etc. Yeah, why would you do that in Indonesia? Because you have much better banana varieties who taste much better. So Indonesians do not in general eat many Cavendish bananas. They like mm -hmm. other, you have many other I, grew, I have uh, bananas in my garden, but I don't grow Cavendish. <laughs> I have Pisang Awak, Pisang Salan, yeah. uh, Ladyfinger, other varieties. You have many varieties, like Kapok is quite resistant to Sigatoga, for example. Yeah. So mm. you, you grow varieties or will grow in that area and people like to eat. Mm. And Cavendish is like, uh, what do they call that? Hotel banana is often called. Yeah, it's like yeah, hotel export yeah. Because mm. it's... Uh, the reason for that is it it ripens uniformly because it, they harvest it green, put it on a ship, and then they add ethylene, uh, etrel, and then they ripen it. Many varieties, like in Indonesia, you buy them, you harvest them almost ripe, very short uh, supply chain. Mm, yeah, you right. harvest today, mm. and tomorrow goes to the market, and the mm. day after someone is already eating it. If you are in Central America and ship it to Europe, they need to be for one month on a boat. Mm. So that's the other problem. Many varieties are not suitable for that sort of transport. Mm. So I, I cannot see a large Cavendish industry ever in Indonesia. Cavendish is susceptible to almost all these diseases. Mm. Mm. Yeah. 
Actually, in the Ramadan days, uh, banana is a very popular food today. Because right. so we have a traditional food we call uh, pisang hijau. Yeah, this is a pisang hijau. <laughs> it's a very popular uh, when we will break end up our fasting in the afternoon. <laughs> it's yeah. a very popular food. This is made up from banana, actually. Uh, well, so this is the last question, actually. Uh, so what do you think the reason? Yeah. Yeah, what do you think the risk of blood disease in Australia banana industry and what has been done and what else need to be done to prepare uh, the event of uh, blood disease uh, incursion? Is it the question is from the uh, Nega trend? Yeah, what do you think, uh, Andre? Well, uh... Blood disease can very easily get to Australia because it's only one plane ride away. Yeah? So even an insect who has visited or a, a, an infected plant in, in, in Bali, for example, many people in Australia go to Bali, they have direct flights. So yeah. if you come back to Brisbane, mm. you can very, the insect gets out of the plane and visits a banana plant, then it's, then it's there. So it can mm. happen very quickly. So what we do is, we try to uh, <coughs> a uh, there is no plantations around uh, airports in general. Mm. We try to we have good detection uh, techniques. If we bring in plant material, it goes as tissue culture and goes to post entry quarantine. Mm. So if we want to import a variety from Indonesia, you cannot just bring it. It goes in tissue culture, gets brought here. We grow it out in, in high security mm. and then we grow it for one and a half years and mm. we test it. And when it's, it doesn't have any bacterial viruses, then we plant it on. So that is all to prevent this from happening. The problem is when it gets, if it spreads more, it spreads all the way to West, West Papua, it goes to Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea in Australia, there's many islands in the ocean there. It, it, we call that stepping stone. So a bird or thing yeah. is moving yeah. from island mm -hmm. to island, and then it will get in the Cape. We used to have 700 kilometers in the Cape where we have no agricultural crops to mm -hmm. prevent that, but that is no longer quite the case. People want to grow things there. There's people who want to have bananas in the garden. So legally, we can no longer stop them. But we try to do everything. This is just one of our diseases we like to keep out. Right. Well, so this last but not least. So mind you, if we uh, share your uh, slide presentation. So some of uh, um, our audience asked your slide presentation in the because uh, of the interesting uh, presentation. So is it possible to do to get the, your slides? Yeah, I will send you a PDF of the slide. Right, yeah. right. Just send to Isra. Isra will spread to the, because uh, of the health systems, uh, how to uh, uh, cut the, uh, the, uh, the slides in the website. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, so, if you want to, I, I will also send those papers I mentioned, because then you have, all right. they have very good pictures and more background in it. All right. Good. Thank you very much for that. So, is there any more questions? If not, we will finish before 10 because of also we have uh, an event at the same time at 10 uh, in the morning. Uh, well, so I can conclude this uh, uh, conversation because of every clear in your last uh, slide, pay what we learn from this. Um, uh, a global uh, spread of banana. So there are four points there, including the high uh, tropical pathogens move faster. So we are really very important uh, for the quarantines here or in the uh, in the airport in the uh, in transportation, for example. And the second is a uh, bridge heat effect. It's an interesting bridge heat, heat effect. Bridge heat effect is same when the COVID pan pandemic, uh, COVID-19 uh, spread around the world. And uh, also the need for eradication, eradication requests and uh, in, um, uh, international more, uh, mo movement actually. So 
Thank you for the learning, double conversation, uh, Andre. This is very interesting. And when you come to Makassar, to Unhas? <laughs> I don't know. It, uh, All right. <laughs> I have not traveled in two years, and I used to travel a lot. So I have many things to do mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. COVID has stopped some of international things. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think that the COVID pandemic, uh, pandemic now is quite uh, uh, calm down now. So the transportation in the airport is open for internal passengers. But well, if the, everything's good, so the time is uh, coming to Makassar. So we will welcome you to if you are uh, if you intend to Makassar and be uh, conduct the research together in. For example, in going to the sewer, uh, Slayer, because of still many mysteries, many mysteries about the mysteries about the blood disease, and then you say before you mentioned, we need to start from the origin of uh, the the center of origin disease, yeah. right? So this is very interesting. Uh, well. Uh, thank you very much, Andre. Uh, I do appreciate with your slide you talk today. This is a very interesting. Many people here from the postgraduate students and undergraduate students, and also from the academic staff around the uh, backgrounds, from horticultures, from the animal, from the uh, plant protection, soil science, and then uh, social economic, and all the grounds in the our in our in the chat room here, understanding your your slide, and it's very interesting. So. Well, thanks once again. I'm back to Isra. Isra, are you still with me? Yes. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much uh, for Dr. Junaid as the moderator. And before, before we end webinar today, we want to say thank you very much for Professor Anna Drent and give your, we will give you the certificate of appreciation from our vice rector of Research, Innovation, and Partnership, Universitas Hasanuddin, where I want to uh, share my screen. Can you see my screen, Professor? Yes, I can see your screen. Yeah. Yes, this is the certificate from our vice rector. And we are, uh, it's a uh, honor for us to have you in this webinar. And this, um, this certificate uh, we will send by email soon after the webinar. Thank you very much, Professor. And then, yes. And then, then let's take a photo together. Is all the participants open your camera? We want to take a picture with the uh, Professor Under Trent, please. Okay, Terry Makasi. Sama <laughs> sama, Professor. <laughs> All right, I will to count 10 seconds. All right, uh, 10, 9, 8. Mm. All right, I think most of you have opened. Well, I would to, so here we have a six pages. So I would start in the first pages. So, all right, one, two, three. Second slide. One, two, three. The third. One, two, three. The fourth. One, two, three. This five, the fifth. One, two, three. The last one. One, two, three. I think it's already. Done. All right. All right. Can finally, yes. Photos. What? It's one. It's one. Oh, all right. Sorry. Yeah, we have a professor E.G. Diana Dad here, so we will take uh one photo again. All right. For the first slide, one, two, three. All right. Done. Thank you, Israimi. Yes. You're welcome, professor. Finally, from the deepest of my heart, we do apologize for all mistakes during this event. Thank you very much, Professor Andre. Thank you very much uh, for uh, Dr. Junaid as a moderator. Thank you very much for your kind attention for all participants. 
And uh, here, I'll to say uh, this is the end of our webinar. So uh, uh, later, we will send you the certificate for Professor Andre and all the participants as the participants as well. Then the material we will send as well by the Google Drive link. So uh, keep attention for your email. Uh, we will send the email soon after this webinar. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Bye bye everyone. Bye bye yeah. Professor Andre. Thank you very much Andre. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Pak Junedi, mana ada Pak Junedi? Ya, I'm here. Nurhalisa, Politani Pangkep, long time no see you. Ah ya, yeah. we met in the airport, ya? Yeah? Hmm, yes. Mm -hmm. Did you remember? Ya, yeah, I go. We were okay. going to the uh, Eccles Club in... Ya, ya, ya. You, you ah, entered some case, ya? Yes. We both. Uh, ah, we grab. With, with Jamila and Bebo. All right. Yes, the name. Maybe Bebo, Bebo. Okay. Maybe Songket in Palembang now already finished because we both. Uh -huh. Oh yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jun. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for everyone yes. for attending this uh, interesting seminar. So hope uh, to see you next again in the uh, next uh, presenter. More interesting. More yes. uh, 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 attractive. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jun. Jun Japri, yeah. where are you? For what? For the discuss about something. Ah, okay. Do you want to send me pisang hijau? Okay. Yes. Accept Why it. do you know him? Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wait, okay. Wait, wait, wait. Accept it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Okay, so can I, can I leave now, Ira? Yeah, everyone.